Good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Talk with Mimi Mefo. We are coming to you from Germany and we are reaching out to our audience in Cameroon, in other parts of Africa and in the rest of the world um, to talk about what's happening in the country at the moment, uh, precisely what took place in Kumba, that is in the Med Division of the Southwest region of Cameroon yesterday. It was um, Saturday, the October 24th, around midday exactly, when armed men on both motorbikes attacked a private college called uh, Mother Francisca International um, College, which is in Kumba, southwest region of Cameroon, like I indicated earlier. The college is actually located in one of the most famous neighborhoods or quarters in this town of Kumba. Uh, it's called Fiango and uh, the indiscriminate shootings by the gunmen killed seven children, according to administrative authorities, even though the figures are currently being conflicted. And it should be noted as well that one of the children who was hit by yesterday's bullet was confirmed dead today, six died yesterday, and nearly a dozen are currently receiving treatment in hospitals. As always, there were witnesses and some have so far been blaming uh, government soldiers, others saying that uh, separatists uh, who have been advocating for an independent state of Ambazonia are also responsible. As of now, um, Mimi Mefo Info has been investigating. We've been carrying out a series of reports, uh, even though the government was quick to issue a statement just barely a few minutes after the incident to say that Ambazonian fighters were responsible. But so far, politicians, civil society actors, um, and even some of the victims of the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon think that na the narrative, as far as the conflict is concerned, has to change. They are now advocating for an indefinite end to the Anglophone crisis with the hashtag end Anglophone crisis, which has been going on for several days now. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by one of renowned uh, politicians in Cameroon, Edith Kawala, who took time, and we are so honored that you took time to be with us today to talk about what's happening in Cameroon at the moment. Mrs. Kawala, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Mimi Mefo. Uh, this is actually the first interview. I have refused all interviews today. It's the first interview that I'm giving uh, since the Kumba incident. Uh, maybe some of you don't know, I am a Kumba girl. My mother is from Kumba town. Uh, so we are talking about my village. We are talking about my home, about a town that I know very, very well. Um, I had to contact all of my relatives this morning um, to find out if they were okay. Um, yeah. I had to talk to kids in my family to reassure them, uh, to let them know that we care about them and um, to try to give them some comfort in this moment because, of course, our first words, our first words go to the families who have lost lives. I mean, it, it is still an incredible thing for me that children who got up in the morning just to go to school, the most banal thing that any of us can imagine for a child, um, should have been shot dead for going to school. And um, our hearts go out to these families because we cannot imagine what it feels like to send your child to school and, and hear such a horrific death befalling the child. And um, our second words go out um, to the rest of those children who were traumatized uh, we always forget about the trauma of those who witness these situations. They may be alive, but the wounds that they have are so deep from witnessing, uh, you know, what happened to, to these other children. And then to the, uh, the entire town of Kumba is bleeding. The entire town of Kumba is traumatized. Uh, you know, I spoke to parents, I spoke to children, uh, for sure, next week, I think most children in Kumba will not be going to school because the parents because are traumatized. Trauma and the impact the children are traumatized. 
and and they are now in a complete uncertainty you know the the, the way this school year started what we thought had happened was that there was some negotiation between uh, 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 with armed groups uh, who had communicated some some tacit uh, okay for uh, for people to go to school. Uh, there was some negotiation with with the government for people to be able to go to school safely. We now see that uh, we, we now see that the the, the, the the academic milieu, the school environment, is not as safe as many people have imagined. It now uh, you, you have you you say you have been speaking to some of the victims. You have been speaking to witnesses, those who are living in the area. Uh, were they able to tell you what happened exactly? What we understand so far is that uh, three to four bikes. Uh, came into this this school. Children were in school on a Saturday. So this uh, uh, Mother Francis uh, International Bilingual Academy, contrary to what government has said, has been functioning as a primary school. It's a well-known primary school. What has changed was that they extended to to secondary uh, to secondary school and. The reason why children were in school on a Saturday is that because of the ghost town on Monday, some of the schools have been holding classes on Saturdays to, to make up for the time which is lost every, every Monday. So that's why those children were in school. And that is why um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gunmen found them in school. No explanation was given as to why they shot. Uh, they came in uh, shooting in the air and shooting at the children. And so far, we don't know who the gunmen are. And we do not know who the gunmen are. Uh, several witnesses say they were wearing military attire. They were wearing military attire. But we do know that uh, the separatist armed groups have, have been able to acquire uh, the attire of the Cameroonian military and often wear it as well. Um, and we also do not know, um, uh, uh, they also were heavily armed, heavily armed with uh, AK-47s from what the, um, from what the eyewitnesses are, are saying. saying. So right. These were not the traditional guns. Uh, these were, uh, there was sophisticated weaponry. Um, so uh, that is the situation right now on the ground. Now, in a town like Kumba, which is also heavily militarized, like the towns of Limbe, Boya, and Bamenda, other towns hit by the Anglophone crisis, what does this tell us that in the heart of the city, such an attack would take place in broad daylight? I think, Mimi, what it tells us, or oh, by by the accounts of all the eyewitnesses, it happened extremely quickly, very, very quickly. And I think what it tells us, some of us have been advocating with government and telling them that the, the solution to this crisis cannot be a security solution alone, because it is impossible for you to, to put a military person on every corner of every street and and to be able to secure you know the entire northwest and southwest in this in this manner and that is why we have said it's not about just crushing amber groups just showing military strength and so on we must get to the root causes of this crisis every day that we waste because we have wasted four years without going to true dialogue to get to the root causes of this uh, of this problem, every day that we waste, the this, this situation becomes more complex. Now the armed groups are fragmented. You have an armed group. Every division, every village has its armed group. They are, they do not have a central command. Uh, they they can carry out action which they themselves feel is uh, justified in one way or another. 
and uh um you know government has made this situation so complex by not addressing it on the the front of dialogue the front of bringing communities together to reconcile to rebuild the foundations and we are really seeing that if we continue on the path where we are we will continue to count deaths like these ones I think one of the key actors in this Kumba attack is uh, uh, the teachers. We are still to get to talk to the school authorities and also the teachers uh, to tell us more about what happened. But then we had the senior divisional officer reacting just a few minutes after confirming to the media that uh, security fighters were responsible without thoroughly investigating how and what really happened. Uh, how, how do you how was it how do you know that the, the findings were the right one i mean the findings or the statements from the senior divisional officer given that he was speaking just barely a few minutes after the attack what would you have to say i i listened to the the senior divisional officer's press conference and i tell you i was i was very disappointed uh, our government has used a strategy since four years, and they seem not to evaluate that strategy or think about, uh, you know, how to improve upon it. What did the senior divisional officer do? He accused the entire population. He, 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 in his press statement, he said that the population is responsible. That is what he said. He accused women. He said women are harboring those uh, uh, um, separatist fighters and he called on the the delegate of women's affairs that she should go and meet the women for them to bring out the boys now uh mimi mefo we this has been a cycle throughout this conflict separatist fighters are guerrilla fighters it's a guerrilla type of fight so they come in they attack and they are gone and the army comes after they have gone and uh, wages war on the entire population carrying out massive arrests the 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 the, the, the um the senior divisional officer he promised arrest to the population uh, he promised that if they, they do not bring out the boys, they are going to suffer a lot of consequences. This is what has been happening for four years. The result is that innocent people begin to suffer for what a, a very small group. Every All the eyewitnesses, there were no more than 12 people. They, they talk about 10 to 12 people. Now, you are wanting to, to punish the entire population. What does that do? It, it creates a new injustice. It radicalizes people. It makes people vulnerable to the violent separatist groups. We have been doing this for four years. It does not work. And I was so disappointed to hear the senior divisional officer talking about the same tactics, the same things that have been ongoing for the last four years. We have to realize that we understand that it's necessary to have a military strategy. This is absolutely uh, correct. You cannot have people shooting at children and then you say you are not going to have a military strategy. So we are not saying there must not be a military strategy, but we are saying that in complement to that military strategy, we have to talk to our people. We have to sit down and talk to the communities. There are so many stakeholders, so many um, uh, people who are concerned by this crisis. But then, how do you trust? How do you trust the military strategy when we've seen soldiers shooting at children? We've seen the situation in Gabo. We've seen it in the far north region. We've seen it in localities like in Moyoka. How do you trust the military and its strategy when and they are also inflicting pain and pain. shooting Ab at civilians? Ab absolutely. And that is why we talk about having a dialogue. Because dialogue means that I have the opportunity to tell you what you have done to hurt me. 
when we are talking about that dialogue, this military must be there because the military has throughout the four years committed its own atrocities committed its own acts of horrific violence upon this population. And if we are talking about dialogue, it is to have the different stakeholders there and to have people have the opportunity to tell this military that this is what you did to me. Uh, you know, uh, Mimi Mefo, as stand up for Cameroon, we spent the last week in, in Yaoundé up to Friday. And on Friday, we spent about three hours with the Minister of Ter Territorial Administration. On our agenda with him, the Northwest Southwest crisis was on the top of the agenda. Can you believe this man told us that the war is over, that the war is finished, that uh, they, have, they have conquered the, the, the situation, military speaking. This was just barely 24 hours before this Kumba incident. And we were insisting to tell him, Mr. Minister, the war is far from over. And this is like some sort of a tipping point in the crisis. Absolutely. And, and uh, Absolutely. you are one of those who've been advocating for back to school because you feel that um, children are supposed to be allowed to go to school. There are yes. so many stakeholders as well who want children to go to school. But seeing this happening, how safe are the school environments for children? The schools are clearly not safe. As you say, Mimi uh, Mefo, uh, uh, we have been advocating one for nonviolence. So I think we are one of the groups who have said very clearly to everybody in the Anglophone regions, yes, we have an Anglophone problem. Yes, we have been marginalized as Anglophone. Yes, a lot of injustices have occurred. And over the last four years, they have, they have gone tenfold what they used to be. But no, we should not fight that fight with violence. Violence begets violence. And we are now at the stage in the Anglophone regions where we don't know who is shooting at who. We have an incident such as this one in Kumba, and we cannot clearly say it is this person or this person. And that is the result of deciding to use violence as your arm. So until to, today, I am calling on all of those who have taken up arms and saying to them, yes, we must fight for our rights. Yes, we must stand up to what is happening to us in this country. Please let us do so without guns and so those who are watching us live there on facebook on youtube and even on twitter please uh you can ask your questions and she's yet to respond to all your questions we might not be able to take all the questions but uh the key questions that we uh, place our hands on to uh, on would uh want you to respond to them uh if you can of course now we would continue with the, day, the debate at this point in time to look at reactions so far politicians have been talking civil society actors Cameroonians, even artists now are speaking out. So many people have been talking. It's been an ongoing debate for almost uh, almost forever, but now we see that there's more pressure on the actors uh, in the conflict to end what is happening. Before we come to the campaign that's ongoing, I want you to tell me why the international community is uh, not taking any strong action, any powerful action to see into it that the crisis ends. Why is, that, why is that not happening? I think there are several factors. I think there are several factors. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when you take, when you take up arms, it, you know, the definition of a state, the definition of a state in our world today is that the state has the monopoly of violence. So whenever you take up arms against a state, you embarrass all other states because they will have difficulty supporting you because they would be creating a precedent which they themselves may suffer from today or tomorrow. So whenever you take up arms and decide to fight a government with, with violence, you, you lose the moral high ground. You, you lose that advantage of being able to say, look, we are protesting peacefully and government 
is being violent against us. So that is one factor. The second factor, I think we cannot go into here, but it is geopolitical. Cameroon happens to be uh, the largest country in the Central African region and the country that has in the Semak region and, and the country uh, that has so far been looked at as the stable country. Uh, if you look at around us, we have Central African Republic, we have Chad, we have uh, uh, countries which have had a lot of uh, uh, strife. Yes, so for, for most of the international community, their attitude has been, can we somehow cajole this government? They, they don't want to come out hard against the government because of the position we occupy in the, in the sub-region. And so uh, their tendency has to be has been to do a sort of soft soft diplomacy rather than to come out aggressively against against government. And of course, every time they have had strong statements against government, because we have seen statements from the European Parliament, from the from the the United States Congress, uh, uh, even from uh, different UN bodies. And every time they come out with a, straight sta a strong statement, government says, but look at who we are dealing with. We are dealing with separatists who are kidnapping. We are dealing with separatists who are keep cutting off people's heads. We are dealing with separatists who are committing violence on, on uh, children. So they use those actions to justify their own violence. And so... Uh, the 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 international and at the same time the the crisis is persisting and the crisis is persisting. With untold hardship difficulties exactly. misery on uh, the local population exactly and as I mentioned we were in Yaoundé last week we met with five uh, embassies and uh, uh, one of the UN bodies one of the embassies we met with was the embassy of South Africa who is also presiding the African Union at this time. And our advocacy to them was to put Cameroon on the agenda because you, it, most interestingly, you find that the Cameroon case, the Anglophone crisis has not even been discussed. I mean, the most shameful thing is that it has not even been discussed in our own parliament, uh, but it has not even been discussed at the level of the African Union. It so has why, not does been the, why does the problem lie? Why is it account. taking, where does the problem lie? So the problem lies once again a bit in geopolitics because in all of these instances, somebody has to bring your case to the table. So the, the institution itself does not just sit and bring a case. Somebody has to bring the case to the table. And we found that you, generally the way international politics works is that it is your neighbors, those who risk Worry. suffering from the yeah. spillover of the crisis, who would be the first to act? But we find, for example, our biggest neighbor, very, very influential, um, is um, Nigeria. Nigeria. Now, it so happens that Nigeria is cooperating with Cameroon on the fight against Boko Haram. It also so happens that Nigeria has its own separatist uh, conflict. Uh, Yes, a movement in, in the Biafra movement. So they are unwilling to, to take any action which looks like they may be supporting a separatist uh, uh, movement in Cameroon, especially as they need Cameroon to fight against Boko Haram. So these are some of the complexities which many people do not uh, understand. And uh, in as we are advocating we, it is why we are meeting some of these countries personally, putting uh, to them this, this situation and insisting that in spite of all this, Cameroon has to get on the, the international agenda. Now that everyone is sympathetic about what happened in Kumba, it was a similar thing about Ngabu. We saw the outcry uh, when other incidents happened in the far north region. Are there any prospects that the international community can now wake up and say, what's happening in Cameroon? Let us do something and we need to do something fast. I think for sure this incident um, 
if we advocate properly, because the other thing Cameroonians have to realize is that the international community is looking at the whole world. They are not sitting and looking at you as Cameroon. So we must advocate. We have to be our own champions. We got international attention on Garbu because we acted here on the ground. And we are calling on Cameroonians for Kumba that we make sure that we come out. We are currently organizing um, ceremonies, first of all, to honor these children, to honor all of those, all of the victims, those who have died, those who have been hurt. Cameroonians must come out massively for these ceremonies because that indicates to the world that we have a problem. We are working on protests to put pressure on government to, to have an approach which is uh, uh, multi-pronged, that does not only focus on a security uh, uh, strategy, but also includes the, the, uh, the, the, the strategies of dialogue, of justice. So much atrocity has been committed. Those people deserve justice. I see some people asking about Ngarbu. Because we came out on Ngarbu, for the first time in Cameroonian history, the government admitted that it, ha it was responsible for the deaths of civilians. The Ngarbu case is ongoing. There, there are soldiers who are currently in court with regard to Ngarbu. We are not satisfied with that because we all know that it is not the soldier on the ground who takes a decision to attack. That soldier is only following orders which have been given right up to the political level. Because even the entire army, we must always keep in mind, an army is the instrument of a government. An army does not decide itself to deploy itself. It is the political decision makers who decide to deploy an army, who, who talk about the level of force that is to be used in situations. So we must never remove the responsibility from this government. The responsibility is in the hands of government and it is up to us to put pressure. We, we should stop with the talking, Mimi Mefo. We have talked and talked and talked. We yeah, now when, you, when, you, when you look at what uh, people are saying there online, you, you get the impression that everybody is fed up. They are tired yeah. of getting the same condemnations. Uh, the, we are condemning what happened. We don't want this to ever happen again because the next day or the, the coming weeks, the coming months, you would there still get another more case. and more reports. Yes. Now, the, the, the question is, what next? There's an online campaign and the anglophone crisis. It's been going on on Twitter, on Facebook, and on other social media platforms. Uh, this call has been going on. People have been talking about the need for the anglophone crisis to end long time ago before it transmits. People have been talking about end the anglophone crisis long time ago. I should say it simply just intensified. So what is different this time around? Um, I We are so thrilled. Uh, I want to congratulate everybody um, who has been on the end anglophone crisis hashtag. And um, I think the end anglophone crisis hashtag uh, uh, came out very strongly again because we had a, a little, a small success with the end phone tax uh, campaign. We, we had an end phone tax campaign and we were able to push back government as regards the phone tax which they were going to impose on Cameroonians. So I think this gave people courage, it gave them energy, and um, it made people realize that when we act, when we make our voices heard, we can actually have impact. So that I think is what has given end anglophone crisis, uh, the new energy and the new surge. And I congratulate everybody there are some amazing amazing young people who are driving that hashtag um i love the fact that they are writing to me in box and they are they're asking me you know madam kawala what are we doing what is the next step and so on and we are talking together because we know that we have to move from the internet to the ground we have to move from the internet to the ground Tweeting and posting is action, it is good, but it is not enough. We have talked 
for four years, we now have to have massive brown action that obliges government to act. Now, we had this question from one of the viewers um, asking about Ngabo, like you said, uh, the responsibilities. Uh, we knew that the government was responsible because they came out saying, like you said, that they are responsible for what happened in Gabo for the first time. It's true that the government also admitted that the killings in the far north region of country uh, were yeah. carried out by soldiers, which is yeah. very rare uh, in, the, in, in Cameroon. Now, after responsibility, the question is what happens next? And there's always uh, the suffering population left behind, the affected population left behind. Uh, is there any, are you, is there, is there any follow up on the part of the government to ensure that victims of such crisis, vic victims of such um, attacks are catered for and uh, followed up psychologically? And um, uh, the government is the government ensuring that uh, there is there is proper follow up and they are also taken care of psychologically. Do you think there is any mechanism in place in that regard? Uh, Mimi Mefo, we are not talking about a different government. We are talking about the government of Cameroon, which is a, a government that has bad governance at all levels. So this same government is not able to deliver water. It's not able to deliver electricity. It's not able to deliver security. So for sure, they cannot manage complex situations such as this crisis. But it is up to us as we come out and we have uh, uh, demands on government, as we come out and we have demands on government, we must include in these demands the, the need for healing for all victims. So victims, it is not just uh, uh, going to a hospital, which of course uh, they must do, but as we have said, the trauma the psychological uh, welfare of these victims, the counseling that they need. These things have been totally absent in this crisis up to now. Despite the horrific things that have happened, um, we have not seen that aspect dealt with. We only see small NGOs and we are thankful for those NGOs who are carrying out, doing their best with very limited means uh, to be able to carry out some therapeutic um, actions. We see some NGOs uh, even using things like art and drama and so on to help children be able to express what they are feeling with regard to this uh, trauma. But it has not been part of the government response. And talking about the end, the Anglophone crisis campaign that is ongoing and the hashtag, which you say that would have to take a different dimension. People would have to go to the field, go out there and protest. Would the same system in place, do you think that there can be any change? The government Would the government be able to listen to you? I think that the, the main thing, we are seeing it all over Africa today. Our neighbors in uh, Nigeria uh, have been having massive protests to end police brutality. And I think we need to draw the lessons and see that it is not a one day affair. It is not a one time affair. It is about the determination of the people to push back on government and actually demand change. Now, you know our position at Stand Up for Cameroon. We believe that the final solution is that this regime must go. We will not get final solutions, long-term sustainable solutions from this current government. So when we are coming out and we are demanding change, we have to be ready to withstand to the point where we actually get sustainable solutions, which for us, as you know, is actually a political transition for Cameroon. Like we said earlier, if you have any questions, this is the time to ask because we have just a few minutes to go. I have this question from Zeda Tinyong who says that I should ask you, Madam Kawala, that if you were president of Cameroon, what would you do uh, immediately to stop the Anglophone crisis? Oh, um, 
if I were president of Cameroon, there would never have been an Anglophone crisis because I am a firm believer in dialogue. And I will never forget, and I will let, never let anybody forget that we had the opportunity for 11 months in this crisis to have dialogue and to avoid all of the violence that we are currently having today. But let us say that I came to power now uh, with the situation already at hand. The first thing I would do is to go to the Anglophone regions. I think one of the things that has been so painful in this crisis is the lack of a top level government presence on the ground. The president has not been. The prime minister has been once in the, in the, in the last uh, uh, four years. We have not seen government showing that concern as if it is its people. A government's job is to keep us alive. Their job number one is to keep us alive. And when they fail at that job, they should be the first to go and take responsibility. They have not done so. So I would go to the ground. And as, as I have said, today, given the way the crisis has evolved, it means starting from the ground up to build dialogue. It means going to every um, municipality, sitting the stakeholders around the table, all of the stakeholders, the, the, the women, the clergy, the teachers, the, the amber, they must be allowed to come to dialogue because if they are not sitting at that table, we will never be able to uh, uh, um, uh, get them to stop. So it means enabling everybody to be around the table and saying, we want to cease fire. What do you need? What must happen for us to cease fire? And being able to build from there, being able to say, this is the transitional justice system we are putting into place. Victims, please step forward. Who are you accusing? Who shot you? Who raped you? Who burnt your house? People know who did this to them. And being able to set up a system so that we can have transitional justice and reconcile the communities. Because one thing that we as Anglophones must recognize is that in Kumba, it was Anglophone children killing Anglophone children. Whether we want to call them, whether they are Amba or they are, they are uh, 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 whomever, they are bandits, they are whatever, it is a lot of the killing has been amongst ourselves. A lot of the, the, the hurt is within our own communities. So we have to sit those communities down. We have to heal. We have to decide together to move forward. And we saw in cases like South Africa, in cases like Rwanda, in case we have so many examples in Africa where people have been able to do this. We learn from those examples and build a process of justice and reconciliation. Well, time is not on our side and we'll have to go. Uh, so far, I'm seeing so many reactions, people talking about what's happening in Kumba, the Anglophone crisis, others saying that the politicians should lead and they will simply have to follow, uh, that they want to see what you uh, politicians are up to. Uh, we would also keep our ears on the ground to um, tell the audiences out there what is happening in Cameroon and beyond. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kawala, for joining us tonight and hope you, to see you some other time again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think our hearts are in Kumba. Um, I think that uh, we have to hold that community dear to our hearts. Uh, if you know people on the ground, talk to them, console them, give them a word of support and comfort in this time and then please please get ready for action in the next couple of days we'll be asking you for specific action we ask you to come out strongly and let us do our best to end this crisis like we have mabel veman saying that why pointing fingers is that what is important now she's asking if pointing fingers at this point in time is important Maybe you might say no or yes. Well, uh, we also want, yeah, maybe you want to respond to that. No, no, go ahead. Maybe you have several questions and I can- No, just, just, just that, that one. So that one. But that is- yeah. um, Okay. 
Um, uh, Mabel, yes, it is important. Can you imagine the parents? Can you imagine the parents on the ground? You think that parent doesn't want to know who killed their child? Who is responsible? Why their child was killed? I think it is important to take responsibility. It's not a matter, we're not pointing fingers for the pleasure of pointing fingers. These are human lives. These are the lives of our children. So we are not just going to brush over it. It is not a general responsibility. We have a government. We have a government. And if you look at the constitution of Cameroon, our safety and our security is amongst the primary responsibilities of that government. And for the people in the Northwest and Southwest, the government has failed for the last four years to keep them safe and sound. Thank you so much once again, and see you some other time. Thank you. A pleasure. The pleasure is us as well. And for hundreds of you who joined us live on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter, we also want to thank you so much. Our hearts are equally with uh, the victims of the Kumba attack of yesterday. They are also in our prayers and uh, wishing you all the best. And thank you once more for listening or watching until we meet again. Goodbye.